Hello, and thank you for tuning in to this 2022 election candidate forum for Thurston County Sheriff. This forum is presented by the League of Women Voters of Thurston County and in collaboration with Thurston Community Media. The League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan organization, neither supporting nor opposing candidates or political parties at any level of government, but instead always working on vital issues of concern to our members and to the public to defend our democracy and empower voters. I'm Karen Valenzuela from the League, and I will be moderating this forum. Our timekeeper is Valley Needham. Thank you, Valley. And our candidates are Derek Sanders and John Snaza. For this forum, each candidate will have the opportunity to answer a series of questions. The first question will be to the candidates in alphabetical order, and after that will be alternated so that each has a chance to start first. Candidates will also have a chance to ask their opponent a question. Each candidate will have one minute to respond to the questions, and the timer will show when 15 seconds are left, and then we'll hold up a stop sign when your time is up. If you don't notice the sign, I'll let you know that your time is up. So the first question, I'll begin with Derek Sanders. Derek, why do you believe you are the candidate, uh, best, uh, that you're the best candidate for this position? Well, thank you. Uh, the reason I believe I'm the best candidate for the position is because I'm still doing the job and I'm very well connected with the issues that we're facing at the ground level. Um, I was encouraged by many people, uh, both within the community and um, within the department to run based on this. And where I lack in the managerial side of things, I make up for tenfold when it comes to understanding the problems at the ground level and how to address those problems when we get to the next level. Uh, I think there's a, a misconception about what the sheriff does. Um, the sheriff is supposed to be the face of the department, um, you know, active at every level, um, whether it's the, the corrections or support services or patrol, um, and their job is to lobby for public safety. And these are all things that I'm intimately familiar with, um, and those are, that's what I bring to the table when it comes to, to being the best candidate for the position of sheriff. Um, I also intend to be a, what they consider to be a working sheriff, so there's nowhere I will send my deputies that I won't go myself. I plan to still strap on a body cam and serve the citizens of Thurston County to stay connected in the real issues that are facing us. Thank you. John. Wow. Well, I've been fortunate enough to be the sheriff for the last 12 years, and prior to that, I was a deputy for 18 years and served in many capacities of the sheriff's office, uh, from being a training officer to a detective to becoming the uh, commander of the SWAT team, commander of the methamphetamine lab team and weapons of mass destruction, and incident response commander. Since then, becoming the sheriff and ensuring that not only have I had the leadership training that is needed to be the sheriff, ensuring that the men and women are also getting the leadership training that they need and the, the training that they need to become better de deputies, detectives, supervisors, and ensuring that not only are we better at being good at our job, but great. And being the sheriff means that I advocate for every citizen in Thurston County what law enforcement should be and ensuring that they're safe. Thank you. And so for the next question, John, you'll go first. As an independently elected official, you may find yourself competing with other elected officials during budget hearings before the county commissioners. Describe how you would manage possible conflict with your fellow county electeds. Um, that's, that's a great question. And Looking at you, we've had those conversations uh, as a commissioner. So uh, though uh, I'm very passionate about what I'm trying to do for the citizens of Thurston County, I recognize the partnerships that are needed and the understanding that it's not just about Thurston County Sheriff's Office, that there is a, lot, a larger role than what law enforcement does. How do we work with the prosecutors? How do we work with Office of Assigned Counsel? How do we work with the judicial staff? So my job is to establish all of those partnerships to make sure that we're all working together. We might disagree on certain things, but in the end, the overall goal is to ensure that our citizens are safe and that we are serving them. 
and what that looks like. And it also helps out the commissioners when, they're for, uh, when they want to serve public safety. Thank you. Derek, do you need me to repeat the question? No, I don't. Um, so when it comes to building partnerships, that's something that I've worked on early. Um, obviously, as the newcomer to this race, I, I don't get to come in with all the experience and all the proof that what I've done so far. So my job ultimately at the beginning was to establish kind of the, the relationships, if you will, um, going into this. And so that's why I've met with approximately 25 elected officials across this entire county. Um, I believe 19 of them have endorsed me so far. And so what I'm trying to do is build these partnerships so that when, when I hit the the sheriff's office, we can hit the ground running. And so um, when it comes to conflict, one thing I do feel like I bring to the table that a lot of these elected officials have complained to me about is there's been a lack of compromise. Um, we obviously have conflicting political agendas throughout law enforcement and throughout the county and throughout the cities. Uh, but the reality is, is that we can still compromise to find good ways to enact public safety while also holding people accountable and reaching all of our goals. And so, again, when it comes to trying to, to build partnerships and, and, and deal with conflicts, um, I feel like I'm, I'm the best fit for the job. Thank you. Um, and this goes to you first, Derek. Yeah. The next question, what is your opinion on recent police reform laws enacted by the legislature, and how much dis discretion do you believe the Thurston County Sheriff has in enforcing legislative mandates? Um, so I'll start with the first one. As far as the policing laws, you know, most of them were good. I can say it. Uh, a, a large majority of those new police laws were good because most of them dealt with accountability, um, expanding the ability for the state to decertify bad police officers so they couldn't just bunny hop to different agencies without being held accountable, um, banning neck restraints, banning no-knock raid warrants. Um, those were all things that, that, to John's credit, we weren't doing a lot of those things. We didn't, we didn't use neck restraints. We didn't, we didn't have no-knock warrants. So a lot of those things were dealing with other departments that hadn't gotten to that point. Um, I still disagree with the pursuit law. I think that needs to be tweaked and enhanced so that we can enact a, a good public safety. Um, as far as the legislative stuff, um, if specifically you're talking about mandates and things like that, uh, you know, the sheriff ultimately has the ability to choose which laws get enforced with the exception of mandatory arrest things. The issue that we're going to have, of course, when we talk about that is if you're going to not take action or take action, you need to be able to stand behind it. John, do you need me to repeat the question? If you could, please. Um, what is your opinion on recent police reform laws enacted by the legislature and how much discretion do you believe the sheriff has in enforcing these state mandates? Well, I, I do believe that um, the last three years have been very uh, interesting and stressful not only to law enforcement, to our own communities. But what I do believe is that some of these laws did need to be changed. That holds us more accountable. And when we're talking about discretion, um, we have very limited discretion. And one of the best things that I've done now is we just got uh, body cameras and in-car video cameras installed in our vehicles and on on the 5th October 5th is when we do the test phase for body cameras and that was a big push not only uh, through the county commission but I think it's a big push with the legislature of how we are holding ourselves accountable for our actions and do I believe that we should be held accountable and that what our discretion looks like what that looks like and how we're utilizing it absolutely with those body cameras Thank you. And you're first on the next question. Um, an analysis of arrest and jail data from 2018 shows significant racial disparities. What do you think the sheriff's office can do to address this issue? Well, that's a great question about racial disparity. I know that the county has now instituted a law and justice uh, person that looks at racial disparity. Also, we have a person in county government that is also assigned to racial disparity and equity. So do I believe that those are parts of the, to solving the problem, uh, looking at what our jail does look like? The best part is, is collecting the data of where are these people, uh, where do they live at to commit these crimes? Are they coming from up north, down south? Who are these individuals committing crimes against us? And what is their race? What is their gender? Why? What is their background? Us getting that information helps us better analyze, not only as a sheriff's office or in law enforcement, but how legislation can work and how we can assist in legislative laws that help us look at what racial disparity really does look like. And that's what we're hoping for. 
Thank you. Derek. Could you repeat it? Because I just want to clarify one thing that you said. An analysis of arrest and jail data from 2018 shows significant racial dispar disparities. What do you think the sheriff can do to address this issue? So um, when we talk about law enforcement, obviously there's two types of contacts really in the grand, if we're going to overgeneralize. Um, we have proactive contacts and then we have reactive contacts, right? So when someone calls 911, we respond. It's, it's as simple as that. If, if the people involved in that incident happen to be people of color, um, then we take enforcement action if a crime is incurred and we move on. Uh, proactive stops are different, right? Those are the ones where police officers are observing things and they're reacting and making enforcement stops and, and contacts and things like that. So I think as the sheriff, the first thing when we talk about racial disparity is we have to split those two categories because one of them we have no control over. Um, the second one, the proactive stops, I think the sheriff's office should start um, tracking like racial profiling data um, to figure out if we even as a whole as an agency have an issue because a lot of this doesn't have anything to do with law enforcement. Um, a lot of this is the social constructs. People of color have not recovered from systemic imbalances that have been going on in this country for decades, um, centuries. And so when you look at Jim Crow, when you look at all these other things, um, these are social constructs. And, and not all of this has to fall into the lap of law enforcement, but we do have a role to play. Thank you. Um, and Derek, uh, you're first up on this one. What do you think would be appropriate training for deputy sheriffs and corrections officers in dealing with offenders who exhibit symptoms of mental illness? Um, well, I, I think that the appropriate training would be to actually have in-person training on this. So every year we have crisis intervention training. Um, it's a new state mandate. We don't have an option. We all do it. Um, but I feel like, you know, as someone who takes the training and as someone who talks to other people who take the training, there's a serious lack of engagement because it's the bare minimum. Um, we are watching, you know, two hour videos on our laptops in between calls. And so we don't really have the time to sit down and really go over this stuff and, and really pay attention. And when you're just watching things on the screen, it's hard to be engaged. So I think the first thing that we would do is we should seek community training on this stuff. There are people in the community who are subject matter experts and we can pull them in and give in-person training that is far more engaging. Uh, but to caveat on that, I also, my vision for the sheriff's office, and again, credit to John, we have a new scout team. And so they're taking the lead on a lot of our mental health stuff. My goal as the sheriff is going to be to capitalize on that and get us to a point where the only time law enforcement gets involved is if there's a crime or if the mental, mentally, um, the person who's experiencing those problems um, is a threat to the social worker who's trying to contact them. John. Could you repeat that question? Sure. What do you think would be appropriate training for deputy sheriffs and corrections officers in dealing with offenders who show symptoms of mental illness? Well, what we uh, did is the crisis intervention training before it was mandated uh, by state law. I actually had all my deputies go through crisis intervention training beforehand because recognizing that not only just the deputies, but our corrections deputies are also dealing with mental health crisis, especially in our jail. And uh, because of that, they've all gone through crisis intervention training and updated training. The unfortunate part about the updated training is in the last couple of years, it has been done on video, but it's been done on video because of COVID. But with well, what we've done as a sheriff's office over the last couple of years is working with the behavioral health organization, getting our scout team, sheriff's community outreach utilization team to deal with mental health crisis and how to better educate ourselves. And uh, we've also switched over to Lexapol, which is a new policy that helps us educate ourselves even more so. Um, and you're up for the next question, John. Um, there have been calls for the county to go back to pre-COVID levels of jail bookings for low-level offenses. Do you think public safety would be better protected by putting more people in jail versus diverting them into rehabilitation programs? That's a great question. What we've uh, seen over the last almost three years, unfortunately, is because of the COVID, how we've restricted individuals going into jail because you have to take a COVID test when you get booked into jail and you have to be in, if you will, a 72 hour quarantine period. We don't have the facility to be able to do that for the amount of people that we would like to see go to jail for being held accountable for their actions. And so uh, we do it based on uh, person to person crimes uh, murder, homicide, rape, robbery, those sort of crimes, and the mandatory arrest, domestic violence, and second DUI offenses. But what we are doing is that we're working with 
BHO with the scout team, being able to get them in other programs, being able to work with law enforcement assisted diversion to get our individuals the help that they need instead of going to jail. And we're also working with other programs that make it better for the sheriff's office and the citizens. Derek. Yeah, so um, when it comes to diverting people, I'm, I'm all for diverting low-level offenders um, to an extent. Uh, when you look at things like drug abuse, the war on drugs failed. Um, it, it did. It, it, it never worked. It, it wasn't working. Um, even, even before you know, the Blake decision was coming down, we were seeing record overdoses. Um, and so what we were doing wasn't working. And so when we had programs like the LEAD program come up, I was all for it, um, which is law enforcement assistance diversion. It's, it's intended to get people clean instead of just punishing them and sending them to short prison sentences so they could come back out and do drugs again. And so I do think the jail needs to be opened up, however, because deputies need to have that discretion to book the people that need to be booked and that's not currently occurring. Um, you know, I know there's been, there's been a huge discrepancy of, well, if you really need to book someone, just book them. But when you talk to the patrol deputies, that's not occurring. And so what we're seeing is that for the last three years, we have pushed people around and we've just keep, we just keep pushing them around. They commit burglaries back when burglary wasn't a bookable offense and they would just go and burg another house 10 minutes later. And so I do think that we need to open the jail up to its full capacity for that, for that discretion. Hmm. Um, so now we've come to the part in the forum where you each have the opportunity to ask e a question of each other. And um, Derek, we'll, we'll start with you. Is there a question you wish to put to your opponent? Yeah, and I'd like to, to caveat this with the fact that I'm, I'm not calling the sheriff corrupt. Um, what I'm asking is that initially I brought up that uh, members of Thurston County Sheriff's Office have committed crimes. They've been placed under investigation internally and no, no, no charges have been filed. There's been no follow-up with the prosecutor's office to hold these individuals accountable on their way out. They've been allowed to resign in lieu of termination with no charges. Uh, my question is, is at the first Jubilee candidate forum, you stated that you did it because the attorneys told you to um, and that it made sense for the Sheriff's Office. Now you're saying it's simply not true. My question is, why are we not holding these deputies accountable? And I have all the documents to show it. Sure. So uh, our, just so I could clarify the question, is it about uh, our canine deputy is in question? There are multiple, okay, yeah. Multiple. Yeah, we've got, a, we've got, we've got a, a deputy who had a bunch of apparent thefts, and then we also had another one who committed, I don't know, 10 to 15 hit and runs um, that was also not, okay. not investigated. I'll, I'll ad address um, how we handle the complaints, if you will, or if somebody is alleged to commit a crime. Um, I established, when I first got elected, an Office of Professional Standards because I didn't believe that discipline was fair and consistent. So that's why I have one individual who investigates all of these. In all investigations, we also have to follow the bargaining contract. What the individual deputy is involved in, in their own bargaining contracts, which Deputy Sanders is a part of. In those bargaining contracts, we uh, established if an individual did commit a crime, and then we refer it to the prosecutor's office to verify whether a crime has or has not been committed. And in the meantime, we're also having to follow the rules of what the law says we can and can't do, and also the advice of the prosecutor's office. So those are the, the rules that we follow under what uh, he's asking about. And, and John, do you have a question for your opponent? The, the question is, and, and you've said it several times, Derek, is that you don't have any leadership experience. And my question is, you have been a deputy for six years. What leadership steps have you taken within the sheriff's office to make you the leader of the sixth largest sheriff's office in the state of Washington? Yeah, so the leadership, that I, the leadership steps that I've taken in my own mind um, is that I've gone out and worked as hard as I can for you, um, regardless of what you've asked and what you have not asked. So every single night I went out and I mentored your deputies that were coming through. Um, I told them about how good of a sheriff's office this was. Um, I took new recruits on ride-alongs and gave recommendations on whether or not they should be hired or not hired. Uh, based on the questions that they posed in those in, in those ride-alongs um, and you know despite some of the hardships that we've experienced at this sheriff's office 
um, you know, up until about a year ago, um, I was your biggest fan and supporter. So I was leading by example every day as a deputy sheriff for you. Um, I was literally laying my life on the line for you as a deputy every single day, and I think that's what the voters see. I think the voters see someone who has a very strong work ethic and, you know, leadership qualities. There's, there's no amount of classes that can teach you how to be a leader. Leadership qualities are, are inherent to the person involved. Um, that I, don't, I don't think going to any, any management classes or FBI leadership classes is going to teach someone how to be a courageous leader. I think that's something that people inherently possess. Thank you. Um, Derek Sanders, John Snaza, thank you both for participating in this candidates forum. And thanks also to Thurston Community Media for sponsoring this with the League of Women Voters. And thanks to our timekeeper, Valley Needham. Um, you can expect to receive your ballot in mid-October, um, and you must return your ballot by November 8th, either in a ballot box or postage-free in a mailbox. Um, you can vote uh, up through uh, November 8th, 8 p.m., and you can register to vote online through October 31st and in person up through 8 p.m., November 8th. So our final message to you is please be a voter in the upcoming general election. Again, thank you to our candidates. Thank you.